on this episode of Peak. What's in a name? The real people behind scientific units of measure. Part 2. In parts 1 and 2, we are discussing the fascinating scientists and inventors whose names became units of measure we use every day. In this video, we'll discuss the men behind watts and decibels. James Watt Scientific unit, the watt, measures, power. James Watt was born in Greenock, in the central lowlands of Scotland, in 1736. His father was a successful shipwright and ship owner, and his mother was a well-educated woman who schooled her children at home. At an early age, Watt displayed an impressive mechanical aptitude, deconstructing and reassembling his toys with a small toolkit his father had given him. He also enjoyed finding spare parts and creating completely new toys. As he grew older, he worked in his father's shop, using the tools and forge to expertly craft items out of wood and metal. A workman, employed by Watt's father, once remarked that Jamie has a fortune at his finger ends. Watt was poised to join the family business when that business went south, following a string of unfortunate events, including the loss of a valuable ship, his father's ill health, and the death of his beloved mother. At 19, James left home and traveled to London to serve as an apprentice to a mathematical instrument maker. In those days, mathematical instruments specifically referred to navigational instruments for ships and land surveying equipment. Finding London unpleasant, Watt returned to Scotland after only a year, hoping to set up his own shop in Glasgow. The Glasgow Guild of Hammermen, move over Thor, had other ideas. They had jurisdiction over any craftsman who used a hammer, and since Watt had not finished his requisite seven years as an apprentice, they blocked his application, despite the fact that there were no other mathematical instrument makers in all of Scotland. Watt was stuck. Luckily, the University of Glasgow had accumulated a number of astronomical instruments and needed a craftsman to repair and maintain the equipment. There, Watt made and repaired brass reflecting quadrants, parallel rulers, scales, telescopes, barometers, and countless other precise items. He quickly became an asset to the university and began participating in demonstrations and was frequently consulted by teachers and students. In 1759, a friend of Watts turned his attention to the science of steam. Intrigued, Watt begins making instruments to experiment with steam as a source of motive power. In 1763, the university tapped Watt to repair a Newcomen engine. The Newcomen engine, shown here in this drawing, was the first device to harness the power of steam for mechanical means. It had already existed for 50 years, employed solely for the purpose of pumping water from mines. The design and application had not changed since its inception, and people gave it very little thought outside of its role in mining. That is, until Watt came along. Even after Watt worked his magic, the engine barely functioned. The problem was inefficiency. Three quarters of the thermal energy produced by the engine was consumed by the repeated process of heating and cooling the cylinder. That left only a quarter of the thermal energy remaining to drive the mechanical process of pumping water. Since the inefficiency was inherent in the engine's design, Watt knew that he'd have to design a new engine to solve the problem. Unfortunately, a lot of the literature on what we now refer to as thermodynamics was in French and Italian, so Watt promptly learned those languages. Though Watt soon developed a workable design, there were many obstacles. Now when we think of engines, we picture the small one in our lawnmower. But these engines were enormous. The Newcomen engine, shown here, was two stories tall. Watt's first engine stood 24 feet tall and required a building to be constructed to house it. Watt needed capital to build such large prototypes and test them with different parts and components. He took on investors to fund his efforts. And speaking of parts... In those days, iron workers were more like blacksmiths than modern-day machinists. The precise parts that Watt and his team required, such as the piston and cylinder, could only be produced by highly skilled craftsmen. 
So he employed the services of the Soho Foundry, a progressive factory owned by Matthew Bolton and employing the finest iron workers in the world. The two men formed a lucrative partnership that would last for 25 years. Through his tinkering, Watt developed an engine with a separate condenser that prevented the loss of heat and subsequently power. By 1776, Watt had installed his first engines in a number of commercial enterprises, and they were working wonderfully. At first, Watt's engines just did what the Newcomen engine had done, pump water from mines, albeit much more effectively. Watt spent the next five years installing them throughout England. But Watt wasn't finished. He continued making improvements to his design. With the addition of a double-action piston and parallel motion, the engine could now push in addition to pulling. Pushing meant that the engine could now turn a wheel, something that, at this time, was accomplished mainly with horses or by water wheels at mills. The applications were now infinite. More developments were made to make the engine easier to manufacture and install, and safer and easier for the owner to operate. The rest is history. Watt's engine became the beating heart of the Industrial Revolution, providing the motive power that drove countless businesses, spurred the development of innumerable technologies, and induced tremendous social change. The steam engine is his crowning achievement, but Watt also invented a copying press, an ancestor of the photocopier, a sculpting machine that made busts and figures, an attachment for telescopes to measure distance, a steam-powered machine for drying cloth, a chemical agent for bleaching. He also designed plans for a steam-powered car he called the road steam carriage. James Watt even coined the term horsepower. In his honor, the scientific unit for power is named the Watt. James Watt died in his home at the age of 83. To this day, nearly 200 years later, he is still held in high esteem. Alexander Graham Bell Scientific unit, the decibel, measures, Intensity of sound. Thirty years after the death of Watt, Scotland became the birthplace of another brilliant engineer and inventor whose work would change the world. Alexander Graham Bell, or Alec, as he was called by friends and family, was born in Edinburgh in 1847. His father and grandfather were professors and researchers in speech therapy and elocution. Bell's mother was deaf, a fact that made him deeply sensitive to the needs of the hearing and speech impaired. Bell would often sit with his mother and tap out family conversations in a manual finger language so she wouldn't be left out of the fun. Ladies, take a moment to enjoy this photo. Yeah, I know, right? Although Graham is now part of Bell's well-known name, he was just born Alexander Bell, and at the age of 10 he asked for a middle name as his birthday present, envious of his three named brothers. His father picked Graham in honor of a good friend. As a young boy, Bell was exceptionally inquisitive. He gathered specimens in nature, conducted experiments, and dabbled with tools. One day, while playing with a friend at his family's flour mill, Bell inquired about work needing to be done. The workers explained the laborious process of removing husks from wheat. Twelve-year-old Bell promptly went home, tinkered around, and returned with a device that he had built for the mill. Rotating paddles studded with nail brushes that de-husked the wheat beautifully. The device was put into operation and used in the mill for many years. As a thank you, the friend's father gave the boys a run of a small workshop and encouraged them to invent. Bell's own father was also very supportive, once taking his sons to see an automaton that simulated a human voice. Inspired, the three boys set out to build their own talking mechanical head, and did so with great success. The lifelike head could speak with the help of a bellows, forcing air through a windpipe, croaking out the word Mama to the delight of friends and neighbors. Despite an interest in science and engineering, Alec Bell was a lackluster student, often absent or indifferent. 
He left school at 15 and traveled to London to live with his grandfather, who was finally able to kindle a love of learning in the teenager. He got a job at a college and attended classes part-time. In his spare hours, he conducted experiments, playing with electricity in an attempt to convey sound. He even installed a telegraph wire from his room to a friend's. Following the death of his brother, Bell returned home and became a teacher of deaf and speech-impaired children at his father's school. His students flourished under his tutelage, and Bell began to realize his calling. After the death of a second son to tuberculosis, Bell's parents moved the family to a Canadian farm, hoping for fresher, healthier air for their only remaining child. In Onondaga, Bell became acquainted with the Mohawk people, who lived nearby in the Six Nations Reserve. He learned the Mohawk language and even translated the unwritten vocabulary into his father's visible speech system for the deaf. The tribe awarded him the title of Honorary Chief and invited him to ceremonies and traditional dances. On the farm, Bell set up a workshop and began experiments based on Hermann von Helmholtz's work with sound and electricity. He rebuilt a pump organ to transmit music electrically. In 1871, Bell traveled to Boston, Massachusetts to train instructors at the Boston School for Deaf Mutes, now the Horace Mann School for the Deaf. His instruction was so beneficial for the school that Bell was invited to several other schools across New England. His success spurred him to establish a school of his own in Boston, the School of Vocal Physiology and Mechanics of Speech. Helen Keller was a student. She later stated that Bell dedicated his life to penetrating that inhuman silence which separates and estranges. Here's an image of them together. Bell continued to experiment and invent, next creating what he referred to as a harmonic telegraph. Thanks to investment interest in telegraph center developments, Bell secured two wealthy patrons to support and advance his work. He hired a brilliant assistant, Thomas Watson, seen here, and the two men committed themselves fully to Bell's brainchild. On August 3, 1876, Bell used his harmonic telegraph to successfully transmit human voices along telegraph wires to a location five miles away. The telephone was born. As a side note, I encourage everyone to look up inventor Elisha Gray to find out how close he came to snapping up the title of inventor of the telephone. After their successful test, Bell and his partners made an offer to Western Union, outright ownership of the patent, for $100,000. The short-sighted Western Union president laughed at them, calling the telephone a toy. Just two years later, he told associates that he would be willing to pay $25 million for it, but it was no longer for sale. Alexander Graham Bell is best known for the telephone, but his interests and inventions were diverse. He went to bed every night reading the Encyclopedia Britannica and jotting down his thoughts. He had 18 patents granted in just his name, and another 12 shared with others. Fourteen of the patents were for the telephone and telegraph, but four of his patents were for the photophone, a device to transmit speech on a beam of light. Five patents were for aerial vehicles. There were four patents for hydro airplanes and two for selenium cells. Bell also invented a metal detector that he used in an attempt to locate an assassin's bullet buried in the back of President James Garfield, a metal jacket to assist in breathing, the audio meter, a device to detect minor hearing problems, and a device to locate icebergs. He also theorized and experimented with the following, removing salt from seawater, determining alternative fuel and energy sources including using solar energy to heat homes, and composting toilets. While working in his Volta laboratory, Bell and his team experimented with impressing a magnetic field on a record as a way to reproduce sound. When they failed to develop a workable prototype, they abandoned the idea. Sadly, since this is the technology behind the tape recorder, the hard and floppy disk drives, and other magnetic media. 
Bell died in 1922 at the age of 75. On the day of his funeral, phone companies silenced all telephone calls. Six years later, Bell Telephone Laboratories named their transmission unit the Decibel in honor of Bell. Decibels are used to measure sound levels, but are also used in communication and electronics. To experiment with decibels, turn the volume all the way up whenever you listen to Peak. Thanks for watching Peak! For more information about the subjects of this video, review the information box below. If I piqued your interest, please give me a thumbs up or subscribe to further cure your curiosity.